नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय नमस्ते so now we're back to the spiritual insights on chapter 18 of the Vidyeshwara Sanghita of Shiva Purana. And uh, I had to do that little mini-series <laughs> to explain the background knowledge so that the things that are discussed in Shiv Purana will be clear. Uh, chapter 18 is about Bondage and liberation. Bondage means being in materially conditioned consciousness and existence. So one is forced to take a body, and one identifies with that body as the self, and then becomes bound by eight chains. Prakriti, which means nature, and refers to the body and all its attachments and so on, its necessities and needs. And then there's false ego, ahankar, thinking, I am this body. And then there's ignorance, because I don't know the Vedas, I don't know Upanishads, I don't know the absolute truth. And finally, there's the five tanmatras, the five elements, earth, water, air, fire, and space. Akash is sometimes mistranslated ether, but ether is a, uh, how can I say, obsolete term. <laughs> what it really means is space, that which makes room for everything and doesn't stick to anything, doesn't become conditioned by anything, and which is frictionless and empty. So these things these eight things chain us to material existence. We're bound, bandha. Uh, and the opposite of that, of course, is liberation. In liberation, we become free from these things. And of course, the path to liberation means gradually learning to control all these eight things. The nature, the principle of nature, the body, the false ego, the mind, the different desires and stuff, and the five elements. So when one becomes expert in controlling these things, then he can be said to be eligible for liberation. <laughs> liberation is not something we can do. It's not an object to be manipulated, like the things in the material world. Rather, it's a boon. It's a blessing. It comes from higher authorities. It has to, because liberation really means we no longer consider ourselves the doer, the proprietor, uh, the owner. And that means we can't do liberation. If, if we try to do liberation, we wound up right back in the ego again. Oh, I'm the doer. See, I own liberation. I have attained enlightenment. Huh? All this is nonsense because it's, it reinforces the ego. So in this chapter, chapter 18, Sutta explains the means of liberation. And basically, the means of liberation are purification. Purification from all these eight things that bind. And when the purification is complete, then Shiva and or Shakti give their blessing and give their boon, their anugraha. And this is liberation. So, Although, in one sense, Shiva and Shakti and other deities are metaphors for things that are actually beyond human intelligence, 
Uh, they abstract the power of God into a human-like form uh, for our benefit, because our intelligence can't grasp that which is completely beyond. Huh? Shiva and Shakti are both actually Brahman. The Nirguna Brahman is Shiva, and the Saguna Brahman is Shakti. So together they make the world as it is, where we find ourselves. And it, it's no use to ask, well, how did we come into this world? How did we become conditioned? If we're actually Brahman, how do we become covered over by a material nature? How do we become bound by these eight different things? It's useless to ask this question. In the Vedas, maya is called beginningless. So <laughs> there's no use in trying to inquire into when or how did I become uh, trapped in this material world. Because even if it was possible to know, it wouldn't do you any good. See, the Buddha attempts to explain it in the Paticca Samuppada, which we've done quite a bit of uh, explanation of. Um, but still, even he can't explain it completely. He has to start from the stage of ignorance, causeless ignorance. That's the only way to explain it. In other words, it's just the way it is, and you have to accept it. Huh? I mean, here we are, right? So considering all this, then the way of liberation means to purify the soul and the consciousness from these eight things, the five elements, ego, desire, uh, ignorance in general, huh? because all these things are temporary. They come into existence at some point, they last for some time, and then they go away, or they transform into something else. Even the body, the body is so important to us, yet we know it's going to die. It's going to become old and dysfunctional and useless, and then we have to give it up. So before that happens, well before that happens, we should engage in intense sadhana as much as possible, given whatever situation we're in. And the Shiva Purana, as you have heard so far, if you've been following this series, gives many, many suggestions for sadhana. This section especially gives many, many suggestions what you can do. Now, many of these things are beyond the scope of the individual. They are meant for large temples or kings who have a lot of resources and can uh, support and promote large festivals. Uh, the ingredients are very expensive. The arrangements are quite extensive. And of course, you have to have a whole staff of brahmanas, <laughs> qualified brahmanas to perform these sacrifices, which are very hard to come by these days, except in certain places in India where they're trained up systematically. But even those places are gradually atrophying into senescence in Kali Yuga. They're not getting sufficient support. They should really be supported by the government, but they're not. So they have to get donations from ordinary people. In any case, all the instructions in Shiva Purana about sadhana and puja and sacrifice and stuff like that are simply suggestions. They indicate not a specific instruction, but rather a purpose, a direction, a type of activity that you can perform. Maybe you can't perform it literally according to the instructions in the Purana, but you can do as much as you can in that direction or in that line of purpose. And that will give you the same result. 
In Kali Yuga, there are many adjustments because the conditions in Kali Yuga are so difficult. We have, first of all, rogues and rascals in the position of government leadership, the stealing from the people and withholding the support that they need for comfortable, happy lives, and getting involved in big wars, useless wars, senseless destruction and loss of life, um, only for the sake of their egos and abstract ideas like nationalism and so on. But this is complete waste of human resources and the uh, necessary economic support uh, for actual spiritual life. If the governments would support spiritual education and activities in society, the whole mood would change. I'm thinking of the, the household here, the family where I'm staying in the village up in the mountains. And in the beginning, there were some problems. There were some difficulties because people had, you know, different attitudes and uh, ways of living that were really uh, against a spiritual life. But when we started the temple, when we, uh, you know, came out with this plan, it changed everything almost overnight. It, it took about a week, actually. And uh, I had to lay down the law. <laughs> We're doing this for Shiva. This is not an ego trip, you know, and like that. But the whole mood has changed. Everybody is chanting Shiva mantra, Om Namah Shivaya. And spontaneously, even down to the little boy who lives with the brother downstairs. He's like, you know, four years old. And he's spontaneously chanting, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. So it's wonderful to see how everyone has become so much happier and is getting along so much better, including myself. <laughs> and there's much more harmony and uh, feeling of togetherness instead of a bunch of people just all competing for sense gratification, which like it is in most families. Because we have the center, we have the temple, um, they have a little shrine over here in the corner, but it was really just for solo puja, and it was not really like a gathering place or a center for the whole family. But now that we're creating a temple, there is going to be such a place, and it's already unifying the whole group into a, a spiritual family. And that's really what we want. We want to be aligned with God, with Shiva, with nature, Shakti. We want our consciousness and God's consciousness to merge to be together. And the first step in that is to align ourselves with his instructions. Now, maybe if you especially are grown up in the West, you don't have the background. You don't know why we do certain things, or why certain rules are there or, or suggested. Why, for example, are we supposed to get up early in the morning, an hour and a half before sunrise, take bath and chant mantras and prayers. Why? Huh? Well, as it turns out, the junction between day and night, both in the morning and in the evening, are the best times for worship because it's neither day nor night. See? Day and night are opposite ideas. They're extremes and their conditionings. Oh, it's daytime, or oh, it's nighttime. And so we don't really need that. Uh, what we really want is to align our consciousness with God's consciousness. And when we do that by chanting mantras at any time, we benefit. But of course, the best time is early in the morning 
just before sunrise, and in the evening, just after sunset. And there are innumerable other rules, suggestions, principles, <laughs> ways of life of the sadhu, of spiritual life. Um, and, and we don't have time to explain why all of them are necessary. Uh, that would make everything so awkward and difficult. But you have to take it a little bit on faith. Just like when the chemistry or physics professor describes some kind of a reaction or a principle, in the beginning you have to take it on faith that this is correct until you go in the lab and test it. And if you perform the experiment properly, the principle is confirmed. So this is all we're asking, that you take these principles on just, you know, a pinch of faith, enough to actually try them. And once you try them, you'll get the result and you'll be very satisfied. Like my Adi Guru always used to say, purity is its own reward. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.